January 15 and March 15. Does not necessarily mean the kid need to be in attendance in those days, but the kid need to be enrolled as of those days to get the funding. Uh, for a preschool, this is the, the same definition we have always had. There is no changes to it. You probably know it. I'm not going to go over it. Um, for K through 8, non-AOI, the definition is still the same. The only change started this fiscal year is 7 and 8th grade. It went down to 1,000 instructional hours instead of 1,068. For 9 through 12, non-AOI students, the definition for one FTE will be at least you have to meet two conditions the annual hours and the four subject matters to be one FTE so you have to have a minimum of 720 hours enrollment instruction instructional hours in, in one year and at least four subjects so if you have 720 hours and three subjects that's a part-time student that's not a full-time student uh, if you so you, you've got to meet both conditions and, and this is just the breakdown of those uh, FTE requirements and be in quarter increment 0 0.75 0 0.5 and 0.25 as you see on the screen uh, and we'll go through some examples as well we'll talk about this is that subjects in a year or subjects in a semester or subjects at all times throughout the year, throughout the year. so you could have in other words um, if, you, if you are in a quarter, uh, every quarter you have one subject, and that's you enrolled in four subjects throughout the year, taking each subject each quarter, then 720 hour years, a year, then that's a full-time student. Um, I want to give you an example about how the FTE will be determined. We have in this example a high school student who's enrolled in three subjects, for 612 hours and is scheduled to attend school four days a week for 17 hours a week and um, the student was enrolled on August 15 and withdrew on March 14. And the reason why I put four days because really doesn't matter it's four days, five days, three days because you don't really have the 20 hour requirement a week. You don't have to meet that requirement to have one FTE um, and, and that's really why I put that. So 612 hours divided by 720, that's about 85.85. You always rush down to the, the closest um, quarter increment, which is the 0.75. So that student is 0.75 FTE. The student was enrolled on August 15, so it cover, and withdrew on March 14. So that covered the first period, September 15, and November 15, and January 15. That, that for that particular student, the ADM will be three periods plus zero for March 15 because the student was not enrolled at that particular point, and that's 0.56 um, ADM for that particular student. Um, example two, and, and this to, to address an issue you probably all have it in mind, is what happened if the March 15 happened on a weekend or it happened during spring break or it happened on a non-session day. Um, and this is what this example is going to walk you through. In this particular, the, we have the same info as we had in example one. In this case, the student withdrew on March 17 and Friday, March 14 was the last day of attendance. Then you have the weekend, March 15 and 16 on, on Saturday and Sunday. Um, in this case, you still gotta do your business as usual, the withdrawal process, you, I'm not gonna change that, but we will put a rule in, in the system on our end to take in consideration March 15 and give, it, give you that quarter increment. So the ADM for that particular student, since it's at 0.75 FTE, it will cover the four point in time divided by four, which is 0.75. So you will get a full funding for that particular student. You will not lose that quarter increment. You said? Yes. What if, hypothetically, a child withdrew from school district A on the 14th and enrolled in school district B on the 17th? Who counts them for the 15th? 
Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> I don't know. We didn't really go through that scenario, but that's 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 really good question. I mean, I suspect no one would get that quarter because. So the governor keeps that. Yeah, I guess. I mean, because it, it, it's it's based on enrollment. So the student didn't really enroll till the 17, and withdrew on the 14 on the on the first school. So, I'm sorry. No, her question is a little bit different though. The student withdrew from school district A and went to another district B uh, on the 17th. So really the student was not enrolled anywhere in between. In, in, in the other scenario, if the student withdrew from the district on the 17th, the student was enrolled throughout that March 15 period. But in this example, when the kid withdrew on the 14, the, the student is no longer part of school district A or B. Um, th th this is a little bit different. But if the 14th is a Friday, the 17th is a Monday, instead of school district A gets the funding for it because that's what you say here. Even though enrolled on Monday, the 17th is the new one. So if the 14th is a Friday or the last day before spring break, let's say, then school district A would get credit for that. For <coughs> If the last day of attendance it was Friday, then yes. yes. But if the student withdrew on the 14th, the last day of attendance would have been the 13th because the student would not have come to school on that day. Their last day of attendance would be the 14th. Well, then that would be different. But you know, when we we talk about withdraw, we we were under the assumption that. The parents come on the 14 and say, I'm withdrawing my student. The student didn't come to school that day. Uh, say that again, I'm sorry. The last day a student attends is their withdrawal date. Yes. Correct. But the, the, the rules, that is true. But if the withdrawal, if the student came to withdraw the student on the 14, and the student did not attend at all that day, correct. And that's exactly what I'm saying here. But how is the state, state going to know that? Because the only place we have withdrawal date is on the withdrawal form. What we actually submit to state is the last day of attendance. So state won't know if the parent came in on the 17th or the 14th. They'll just see the 14th. Correct. So how will they fund us for that? If, if the student was enrolled in the 14 and attended that day, or regardless, attended or did not attend, that's not the issue, it's the enrollment the issue, then you will get that funding. My example was earlier, I'm trying to say is, if the student actually withdrew and did not attend, did not enroll the 14th, then you will not get that funding. Okay. But as long as the student was enrolled as of the 14th in your school, you will get the funding for the March 15th. Can I explain that? What he's saying is if the student, if the parent comes in on that Friday to withdraw that student, and that student attends that same day, then you'll get the ABM for that day. But if the student does not attend on that day, their actual withdrawal day will be the, four, the 13th, not the 14th. That's what he's trying to say. We had a question here. Are, are you treating these four days more like a census date, that if someone's in attendance on a particular day? Not attendance. Enrollment. 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 Like, like a census date. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Enrollment, though. It's not attendance. So, yeah, think about it. You've educated that kid for that whole quarter. It's 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 not that it's fair or not fair. It's what the law really says. And then the, the, and I would love to give it to you if we can. But you know, if if the law says something, I can't change the law. No, we're not. Okay. Isn't this whole discussion of this applicable only if the 15th is on Saturday? Correct. Yes. Correct. Or, Sunday. Or, Sunday. Or, Sunday. or Sunday. Or Sunday. Or Sunday. Or Sunday. Any non session or day. Or a break or a holiday. Okay, but what if the 15th is, is midweek and it's your spring break, so you've got the kid through maybe the Friday before he's there? But that is also his last day of attendance and withdrawal day. Your school just went on intercession, but he enrolls at another school 
and he's there at that school now, and they haven't had it, but they just get a quarter of the funding because you're off session. That's that, that, will, that will be a concurrent enrollment. Yes. Then you that will be a concurrent you enrollment. You, you both get it. <laughs> both schools get that day. Yeah. But the concurrent enrollment will so crash down to 1 a.m. at the end of the year. <laughs> Hey, that was good. Are you sure? Hey, we have Rose and we have a bunch of you guys, so uh, it, it, these questions are good because we're discussing them as we speak. I mean, we're not finalizing anything, anything yet. How long was the four-day medium change? And also, was the withdrawal date being the last date of excused absence? Correct. Okay. Correct. And that's, a, and that's another change uh, we actually advocated and we asked to add it to it because we were concerned about if you had an excused absent child that you're going to lose that funding for them just because they were excused. Then they, they withdrew, then you know, we thought it would not be fair. So we added that language to the statutes and luckily the, the legislatures did add it and it passed. Can you repeat that again, what you just said about the the, the excuse absence is, for example, if you had a student who was absent and excused as of March 15, then the parents withdrew the child. So if you follow the, the, the old ADM procedures, you will go to the last day of attendance, which you probably have in all March 10 or March 11. Well, if we follow that, you will not be funded. Under the new changes, you will be funded because as long as the student was excused, it's okay. Um, we, we, we count that toward the in attendance, as if the attendance. So the withdrawal day is going to be the last day of absence. Ex yeah. Excused yeah. absence yeah. or attendance. Or attendance. Excused absence or attendance. Including suspensions, because suspensions can be excused as well. And we'll cover that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Questions back there? I want to get my exercise today. So, for the parents that have to give their child on Friday and go and enroll their child in another school, which happens all the time, we're going to split the concurrency? I mean, it's going to be concurrent? Yes. I mean, currently that's the case too, isn't it? I mean, if you have a student enrolled concurrently regardless whether they were excused absence or not, there is concurrency and you will be losing funding on that child anyway. One day concurrency, not a quarter ADM concurrency. That's a huge difference. That's true. That's true. But these are the concurrency rules. I mean, these are in statutes. This is not something that, I mean, you can always ask for changes. Feel free to go to your representative and ask for these changes if they're willing to do so. Uh, it's not something we can, as a department, really change. It's not, it's not under our authority. I have a question. Go ahead. If a student is planning to stay the whole year, so that would equal the 720 hours, but then withdraws, as in your example, and only attend 612 hours, but they do go through March, let's say March 20th, you still would only get 0.75 funding on them? No. What, what, the FTE determination, it's, it's, it's not really changing as if we speak now. If you had a student who was enrolled full-time and withdrew, that student's still full-time. That didn't change the fact that she enrolled as a full-time. So if the student was full-time and withdrew March 20, regardless of the number of hours actually attended, that student's still full-time. You still be funded 100% for that child. I don't know if you're going to go into it later, but if you are, that's okay. I, with charter schools, we can pay the first of each month. Is this going, how, is this going to work there? Are we going to get partial payments or? I'll go through it. Okay. I have example for that. Okay. Are you going to make this PowerPoint available? <laughs> We will once it's finalized, because this is a preliminary based on the recommendation from the advisory committee. We're going to go and we're going to discuss it all. Once we have it finalized, we will publish it. We will do a webinar to discuss all the changes and we will address it with all of you. And we will hit it in, in, in different ways so we make sure that everybody get the info. Um, 
Um, these are some of the changes that really has to do with AOI. I felt like you probably want to kind of be familiar with it, what happened in AOI, because it is related as, as we go through these changes. Um, and these are in effect for fiscal year 11 going forward, unless, again, the statutes change this year, then we'll address it then. But as, as of now, these 